One of the greatest mysteries of the 20th century, the Dyatlov Pass incident remains steeped in mystery and conspiracy theory. Nine healthy, young, experienced Soviet mountaineering students died in the Northern Neural Mountains sometime between February 1st and 2nd of 1959 under mysterious circumstances. For unknown reasons, the group fled the safety of their tent in sub-zero temperatures and risked exposure to the elements, walking nearly a mile away from the tent in impossible conditions, leaving their shoes, warm clothes, and gear behind. An autopsy later revealed that four of the students suffered violent injuries that could not easily be explained, while the rest perished from hypothermia. Speculation into the cause of the mysterious deaths include theories of UFOs, military testing by the Soviet government, murder by a local indigenous group, a Russian Yeti, hurricane, avalanche, and internal group conflict to name a few, leaving behind more questions than answers. On this episode of Weird Wilderness, I will dive into the high weirdness of the Dyatlov Pass mystery with the number one researcher in the world, my guest, Teddy Hajiska, author of 1079. Her intensive research into the Dyatlov Pass incident is now published online at dyatlovpass.com, and it is the most comprehensive encyclopedia of knowledge on the case that exists to date. Teddy is the first person to translate the case files to English and has acted as the conduit between the Russian sources and English-speaking followers of this case. On this episode of Weird Wilderness, Teddy will share her wealth of knowledge and give insight into what new evidence has been brought to the surface after a recent expedition to the Dyatlov Pass, finally shedding light on the most plausible theory that can lay this mystery to rest. My name is Heidi. Welcome to the Weird Wilderness. Thank you, Teddy, so much for joining me. This is a new podcast, like I said, and I'm very, very excited to be able to speak with you about this case. It's certainly something that I have been interested in, you know, as soon as I first heard about it. And Honestly, the more I dig into kind of looking for answers, the more questions it poses. So I'm just really excited to have someone like you who is an expert, you know, that can really bring a different light to this and just really bring your expertise. So I would love to hear you kind of give my listeners who may be very new to the case kind of a a background, you know, kind of set the stage and and we'll go from there. So why are we so bewildered by this case? What's so strange about about it? Because people die in the mountain all the time. Like when you go to the mountain, even if it's not Siberia and if it's not in the middle of the winter and it, it, it's 59, you still know that things can happen there. This is what you go for. You go for the adventure, for the challenge and everything. So this happened, this particular um, incident, happened in 1959 in Soviet Union, then in a mountain called Ural. Ural is a very huge mountain range, and this particular uh, hike was in the northern Urals. This is not a high mountain, so forget about the altitude sickness and uh, things like that. Uh, it's uh, they were just covering 1,000 meters. Heidi, you have to help me with converting this into <laughs> yeah, I was going to have you convert. <laughs> I don't know the conversion. I'll plug it into the show notes later because I am not good at that. But yes, I'm following you. So it's so not, not high at all, but the climate is brutal. Like the weather, it's a minus, uh, same goes for the temperatures, it's minus 50 degrees. Uh, you have to be... I mean, degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit, I, um, I, you have to add this uh, later. You have to be ready for storms at all times. It's like almost, it doesn't matter that it's so low. You have to be prepared like for Everest. And that's the fact when I, 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 I longed, I dreamed about going into uh, the place where the incident happened. My husband, Yuri, 
said that, well, we have to buy equipment like for Everest because you have to be prepared for minus 50 degrees. It's really brutal. And even in the diary, we have so much left by the dead hikers. We have diary entries. We have photos, a lot of photos. Uh, the leader, Igor Dyatlov, one of his last uh, entries, he said that the wind is like from the engines of, uh, taking, taking off airplane, like yeah. from the turbines, the engines. So it's a uh, very, the elements are really strong, uh, unforgiving. And so they were um, very smart kids. They were students or postgraduates from the Ural Polytechnic Institute. So they were um, well-educated and very prepared for this hike. They were all members of a sports club. Uh, hiking section. Uh, back then, you couldn't go on your own because there were no money, there is no equipment, even you had to be a member of a, of a sports club to help you with partially with the equipment and some money. And then everyone chipped in also some money, but still you go with very old tents, with very uncomfortable and heavy skis. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have any, any special clothes, actually what you wear in the city, because when I flew in Ekaterinburg, which then was called Svredlovsk, and this is where they started from, I, uh, my airplane took uh, from Vienna at 10 degrees and I landed at minus 35 degrees. This is in the city, minus 35 Celsius. This is like, ah, I mean, it's very cold. So whatever you wear in the city, you, you take in the mountain just more layers. You just put layers on top mm -hmm. of you, which is yeah. a lot of weight. In this, and you carry cans, there's no dry food, everything is very heavy, you have to cover a long distance. So this is what made this hike a difficulty three, uh, class three, which was the highest at the, at the time. Right now, they're maybe broken down into four or five. And the other one uh, classification is by season. So this was uh, winter difficulty three. Mm -hmm. And also if it's uh, terrain or water. So in summertime, you have a water uh, the, the tracks and also hiking tracks. So they were uh, at the highest level of difficulty track, which was prepared by Igor Dyatlov uh, for some time. He was really wanting to do that. But nothing was said. Uh, at the very beginning, he wanted to go into a different uh, destination, which turned out to be longer than he wanted or was prepared for. So he changed the route. And then also the members that he um, invited to participate in, in the trek, there were more people that wanted to go and they couldn't make it. Mm -hmm. And also at the last moment, uh, there was a addition of a much older man to the group whom they didn't know. So they started 10 people. Nine of them were knew each other. They were students. And the 10th one was came just at the last moment, literally at the platform at the train station. Part of the equipment was from the hiking club and some of, some of it they brought with themselves. This is important because there were strange things that were uh, found after their death, like radioactive clothes, spoiler mm -hmm. look, right? So who brought it? It wasn't from the club's equipment. And also the supplies, the food, it's very important after that to go over. It's strange that we don't have the, the original list of the food supplies. And one of the hikers was supposed to bring the alcohol, which was for medicinal purpose. Mm -hmm. Only he couldn't find it. He couldn't find the alcohol. Yeah. But they did have a bottle of something. So where did it came from? Anyway, so what's so interesting about the case is that they didn't come back. So they were supposed to go be gone for uh, two weeks. And the, at the last populated settlement, they have to send a telegram that they're starting the trek. And then when they come back, so for two weeks, they were absolutely out of contact, nothing. They don't have radio stations. They don't have uh, even the maps. Back then, it was the, the Cold War and the maps were not precise just so they, then, they don't get in the, the, arm, uh, in the enemy possession, right? So, yeah. So I think I read somewhere too that 
they didn't take a radio, right? Because of how heavy and bulky the radios would have been back there then. There was no such practice at all. Even yeah. when the searchers back, uh, when they started searching for them, the search party had to flow to a plant where they were manufacturing these radio stations. And one radio station was 100 kilos. It was wow. impossible. Also, there was, uh, I mean, I'm not a very technical person, but there was such things like, okay, we have long waves and short waves. So if you need the long waves, there was supposed to be someone on duty to wait for your whatever communication. Mm. But okay. the radio stations were so heavy that it's not this particular group that didn't have it. It, it was just not the, the... Not a practice. practice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. no radio connection back then. And in, the, in our incident that we're going to be talking about, only when they started um, searching for the missing bodies, they, then they had a radio station, which the first set didn't work. The second one, it had to be at precise time in the morning when someone is expecting their call. So their call in the case files, you'll see radiograms. So this is like someone is actually receiving. It's not... Yeah, it has to be at the precise time. The group of uh, Dyatlov, Figur Dyatlov, left. Everything was okay. They were sending their postcards from to, to, to their families. And they went on their way. Hmm. Maybe that is not interesting unless we know what happened with the group, how they died. Because every group leaves, every, every, every group takes photos, uh, writes something in the diary. So yeah. let's say what's strange about this case. They didn't come back. And uh, at the beginning, no one paid really attention because the whole university was on vacation. So, okay, the weather is bad. Maybe it took them some more time. Also, there were, there were cases when they had someone fell ill or something happened. So they had to spend extra days in snow bivad. Mm -hmm. That wasn't unheard of if they don't show up exactly at the time when they were supposed to. So five days, no one was um, really alarmed. And then the families and the, of the, of the students started warring and they sent, uh, they start calling the, the sports club and then they sent a telegram to Khrushchev. So that's important detail. We are in the post-Stalinization era when uh, Khrushchev is in power, but there's still fight between the pro-Stalinist and the pro-Khrushchev. And there is an opening of, uh, uh, it's, the period is called the tow because it was towing this cold area. So it was uh, lifting a little bit the Iron Curtain, um, the Western culture, uh, music, movies, um, influence was kind of already um, uh, coming into the Soviet Union. And the young generation was so happy. They were so full of hope. So there is, everything was very lively back then. And, uh, but Khrushchev had to straighten his power. So this hike happened exactly at the height of the 21st Congress of the party when he, it was an extraordinary Congress, when he had to tighten his uh, position. And everything at that time for the glory of the 21st yeah. Congress of the party, it was dedicated. Even this hike at the beginning, so uh, when they were applying to receive the permit and the approval of the sports uh, club, they were they dedicated this to the Congress. But uh, then it, everyone did that. But it's yeah. important because in the area, there was, it, it, this is not so remote area that, uh, there were only very s small settlements with indigenous people and nothing else and a gulag right there. There was a lot of activity there. There was actually the gulag in, in, in Ivdel, that was the last big uh, village. Well, it's a settlement where there was an airfield. Uh, there is a big gulag and a lot of prisoners. So there is a whole administration and the hospital and everything. Then there is a big um, uh, railway uh, branch that is built also with a lot of sappers, miners, builders, everything, uh, activity. Uh, there were ge geologists. Ural is known for its uh, ore and gold and minerals and oil mm -hmm. and a lot of things. So there were a lot of geologists and everyone was greeting the 21st a Congress of the party. Every everything had to be perfect, you know, all the banners and everything. 
all the, they, they, they had to show results. And at that particular time, the hike uh, took place. So when they didn't show, a telegram was sent to Khrushchev and he made an unprecedented search operation. This is unheard of, even after that. I mean, many people died at that particular year. 50 more hikers died in the area of Ural. There is no such a, a, a search, massive search operation like for, for this uh, uh, for this group, and well, we maybe because he wanted to show how he cares about the uh, Russian, you know, the people of Russia and their kids, or uh, because there was a telegram that was uh, made public, uh, mm -hmm. the, the especially I mean, addressed to him. So they didn't show up. They start say, sending aircrafts from Svedlovsk and students, and no one knew where to look for the group because. The tent hiker turned back on the third day because he had some backache, which was chronic. A lot of theories then after that say that he knew something, he, he caused something, I mean, everything. He was blamed for all of the deaths, but he, he just came back, he turned back because he was hurting and was sick and ill and he was dragging behind the group. And the last possible moment when he could, someone could support his backpack because they changed, they, they, they started on a train, then with a bus, then with a truck and the last, last leg with some kind of a support for their backpacks was a sled driven by a horse. So Uncle Slava with a horse driven sled uh, was carrying their backpacks to the last settlement, which was empty. It was, no one lived there, but this is um, common for the time. Uh, even now, when there was a massive uh, work at a particular place, People were building these uh, houses, which uh, after the work is done, are abandoned. They're just so empty. A whole, yeah. yeah, it's a whole settlement with empty wooden houses, and this is what was the last place where they were seen alive by um, Uncle Slava, who was uh, the driver of the sled, and the tent hiker who uh, turned back. He turned back, he went to his village where he lived because he was in vacation. So he didn't know that his friends and comrades didn't come back on time. And the first time he, he, he heard that there is something wrong is when an aircraft came to his village to take him to recognize them in the morgue. Mm. So it was a big, big blow to him. At this point, when it was Yuri, right? Yuri Yudin that left the group. There were nine people left. At this point, when he left, did, did it seem like everyone was amicable? Like all the, all the diaries reflect that the group was in good spirits and all of that. Yeah, you can see, you can see the pictures. You can see the, the read the diaries because they're all translated. Uh, everything is so normal. And mm -hmm. even the, the, Older guys, Semyon Zolotaryov, who everyone, they even say, well, at the beginning, we didn't want him because, mm -hmm. we, but what we couldn't say no, because yeah. the party and the, the, so, and, but then he blended very nicely because he had uh, more experience. He survived the war. He was 38. Uh, the rest of the hikers were 20 to 23. So he could be, he, he was much older than them, but they say in the diaries at the beginning, we didn't want him, but then he knew songs that we didn't know. It was very yeah. important for them, the songs and the stories. And you see from the pictures that he was kind of a womanizer. He liked uh, Zina and Zina mm -hmm. just, uh, she was, she broke up with one of them. So <laughs> we have the triangle too. So yeah, uh, yeah but the, I mean, when we, when we talk about uh, dating uh, from the autopsy reports, we know that uh, the, the two girls, well, there were nine people after Yudin uh, went back, there were nine, two girls and the rest were men. The girls are virgins. So when we say dating, that means they're holding pinkies, you know? It's yeah. The, so Durushenko, who is, um, I don't know, 21, he broke up with Zina because she was 
too old for him. His friends told him, and she was one year older, and she was so she's so beautiful, mm-hmm. and she was ashamed to go back to her village because uh, they all knew, uh, her family knew the Yuri Drushenko, and she was ashamed and she was heartbroken. And in her diary, you will see a lot of letters. They were writing a lot. This is like. Nowadays, you, you know, social media, you talk a lot. Back then, they were writing letters, mailing them, and we have those letters. So she said, how are we going to go together? We're together, but not together. And now, and we all talk about the leader of the group, Yakov, that liked Zina, which could be the case. Why not? I mean, Zina is beautiful. And there was a photo of Zina in his uh, breast pocket in the jacket with which he, he died. So it's uh, only all Heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. But you see on the pictures, like, Simeon, but Zina is clueless. Like, even the letters that she sent to, to Igor <laughs> Diakov, she's only talking and asking the details about the track, like, where are we going, whether there was no flirting, nothing. It was the friend zone. <laughs> yeah, it was the friend zone because she was still heartbroken. But, you know, you know, it's strange with... Uh, it's the ego. It's if you break up with someone, oh, we want to be friends. But if you're the one left behind, you're like suffering. It's mm-hmm. <laughs> it's always hard for the party that's uh, you know not initiating the breakup. Uh, but uh, then one night they were um, around the fire, both of them, Yuri Grushenko and Zina, and they were. Uh, talking and she says in the diary, oh, he's such a playboy because he, he was already, she said, I've seen him holding hands with another <laughs> <laughs> you know, girl. So they, everything was amicable. They were doing fine. I mean, the biggest problem that was said in the diary is that was too hot. The weather was so warm that the snow was sticking to their skis and they had to stop often to scrape it off. Now, this is, uh, the area is, uh, there are no cliffs, no, a lot of, uh, no no altitude at all, especially uh, most of the days that they went, they went on the frozen bed of the river. So they were on a flat surface, but with a lot of weight, a lot of weight and very heavy skis. So they had to follow a river, right? And um, now the tent hiker, when he turned back, they took some of his supplies. So their backpacks became even heavier. And one of the girls was wounded in the leg the previous year by a with a she rifle. was shot. Was she shot by a hiker or not a hiker, a hunter? I'm sorry. No, it's a hiker actually. Yeah. Oh, was I, it? Initially, okay. Yeah. Initially, it, it's uh, it says in a lot of sources hunting accident. That's why you think it's a hunter, but no. Um, you will see in it's it's interesting to look at pictures from other hikes that they participated in, right? To see what's normal, what's not. And in a lot of hikes, they carry rifles because they have to be able to defend their animals, their bears, and th- th- there are a lot of things. So they carry rifle, but they're playing with this rifle, so they were careless. So she was shot by another hiker by incident. That was Leuda, right? <laughs> Hmm? Leuda, what that was that yeah, Leuda Divinia, right? Yeah. And that's why her family, her parents, didn't want her to go on on this hike because she was still she was wounded in the leg, mm. and her backpack had to be also lighter. So there is more for the rest of the group to carry. Uh, Zina wrote in her diary, so the first day was the heavy. I mean, the hardest one because you have you have your backpack on your back so uh, initially they were when they had the support they didn't carry all that but then the first day was heavy but they could move they stopped often you will see the photos of the breaks because this is when they could take the photos right you have to take back your backpack in order to take the photo they were following the riverbed so no one can follow them because you see back for half a mile there's there was no fog or anything so all the theories about someone following them they were so slow and stopping they could have seen if someone is following them also in this area 
in order to follow someone, you have to pass through the settlements where there are people and every stranger will be noticed. Right. Usually, you stick out. It, yeah, you stick, you stick out, out in that area. Yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, so what, what happened is that uh, when they sent the helicopters to look for them, they didn't know where to look because their final the aim the goal was Otorten. And uh, so they flew, some of them flew to Otorten. But when you go in Northern Urals, all of the pigs, they they don't stand out. It's like they're all the same. In, in mm -hmm. summer, they're all green. In winter, they're all white, but they all look the same. So even, and with a little bit of fog, they, they even dropped them on the wrong peak. So even this was a little bit um, uh, chaotic. Back then, to prove that you have uh, climbed a peak, you leave a note. Uh, there is no... You know, even if you make a photo of yourself, there is no metadata for GPS or anything. So you mm -hmm. can't prove that you're on the peak. So, and also a lot of times it was brutal, the weather. So you don't take off your gloves to make a picture. So they leave a note that they prepare in advance and they just leave it in the box or Kareen or whatever marks the, the peak. Uh, and the next group finds the note and brings it back and leave their own. So until the next group, you can really prove that you have been on the peak because they have to bring back your note and send it, mail it in the mail. So when the helicopters landed on Otorten, they don't land on Otorten, some, some place around. So when they climbed on Otorten, they found the note of the previous group that has been there in summer. So mm -hmm. the group of Yatlo didn't go. They to knew. Yeah. yeah. So they start transporting groups to different areas. How long after um, those transmissions started going out, like from the time where they supposedly... Okay, they were supposed to come back on the 15th. Okay, first 12, then plus three days, 15. The first uh, uh, like group of searchers was sent on the 20th. And uh, it's a long time. On the 26th. It's a very long so, time. So, yeah, a delay. So, until the 20th is normal for a five days uh, slack. Okay. But it's a long time after they know that they were missing until they found them. Because, that, I mean, for six days, they can't even locate where, until where did they cover the route. They have a route of the group. They mm -hmm. can't find them. That's a little strange. And also, the group that found the tent was the only group that had two guides, two local guides. And um, that's something that when you go back uh, seems also strange because they they took the group closer to the tent, but then just before it was spotted, they bailed out. They said one of them got sick and the other one got tired. So they didn't go close to the tent, but in the case files, Strangely enough, they said that they found the tent three days prior, not even with the searchers. Why didn't they report it? It is I mean, details like that are all over the case files. And like everyone's like, well, I don't know, cover up their mental illness. We don't know. But there are so many things, details like that. Like cut branches, no knife. What? Uh, then uh, the lead investigator found a sheet of the knife and put down that this is the knife. How can you not know the difference between a case and a knife? And if they cannot find the tool that they were cut off, that means third party, that means strangers, that means that someone either was there or found them before the official discovery. Uh, this is all over the place. But there were the headlines, uh, headlines as, as you call them, are that when they found the tent, they found it in a strange place for camping because this tent was so old. It was two tents, two old tents, stitched together to fit 10 people. And they were not actually supposed to prop the tent with uh, poles, but it had to hang between trees. It was so heavy and it was designed to hang between trees. It was normal practice back then 
to have a stove. This stove, you're going to hear a lot about the stove, which was designed by Igor Dyatlov, but not only this group had such a stove. Stove is uh, like a cylindrical metal cylinder, which was not put on the ground, but it was suspended inside the tent hmm. on additional rope. To do that, you have to be between trees. This stove does not work on the ground. It has that's, to be there. That's a fact I did not know. So yeah, thank you that, for telling why, me that. This is why the stove, not just because of that, the stove was not used the last night when they're supposedly last night. When they found the tent, the stove was inside its case, right? And uh, uh, reading different sources, you will read differently if they had the wood or not. Were they logs or not? Because you will... Some of the searchers say in their testimonies that there were two logs inside the stove. But that's weird because if you carry logs, you are not going to carry them inside the stove. Right. Uh, means, uh, did they carry wood? Were they intending to use the stove? But if you don't have wood and you are up on the slope, on the bare slope, where it's so windy, you don't have what to melt the snow with. So you don't have water, you don't have uh, wood to cook, you don't have, so this is emergency camping. It's something has to make you uh, pitch the tent there, but it's not even on their route. They were su not supposed to be there because as, as I said, they were, they were going on the riverbed and then at some point they had to climb over a ridge. So they have to go up and they have to go down where there is again trees and forest. So their last diary entry is when they attempted the first time to go over the ridge. It's not high, but it's very heavy. And when you get out of the riverbed, the snow is very deep. So even with skis, you, you sink the whole time. So it's very hard to go up in the deep snow. So they put in their diary that uh, we couldn't get up on the ridge. So we came back and we're going to make the... We're going to leave some of the supplies to make our backpacks uh, lighter. And we're going to attempt again. And this is what they did. But we found the tent not even on the top of the ridge, but half a kilometer, like, uh, I don't know, half a mile on the ridge, which is weird because they were supposed to go back down for the next campsite up on the ridge. This tent cannot stand up like it was found. When we were with Discovery Channel, our ba our camp was built with contemporary tents and e equipment and everything behind a rock. And it was blown away without even a storm rain. This is normal for the area. It was blown away in the second day. And this tent back then in 59 that was propped on two ski poles, it wasn't even stretched properly. And it was behind nothing. It was yeah. on a bare spot. There's nothing. no way. That it's would have supposed blown to away. stay there for one month because they died. <laughs> I mean, this is when the diary entry stopped uh, on the 1st of February. So we think that this is when they died. But this is the only uh, fact that it's um, uh, we base this uh, theory that the diary entry stopped. And basically, this is how far they have come, because we know where the, the last campsite was. We have photos from, from the last campsite, and it's only like two hours or hour and a half from where the tent was found. So based, in the morning, after they, 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 they uh, left some of the supplies and they made the diary entries and everything, they had covered only a one hour, hour and a half, went on the top of the ridge, started along the ridge, which is not on their route, and decided to camp there. That's just no explanation. No explanation. Why was the tent there? And then let's start with the mysteries. Because uh, people attend strange things, like even Josh Gates, his uh, thinking at the end, it's not in the episode, but he said, maybe it's a dare gone wrong like oh can we camp here and can we go barefoot down or something like that so it's like oh uh, no <laughs> because in the mountain in minus 50 where you know it's a survival mode even in the last diary entry the jato said we're so so uh, yeah just 
it's a drain you, from energy. It's heavy. You, you wouldn't want to take those risks, especially the fact that like for your uh, odds of getting out of there, if something went wrong, like how are people going to find you, how you're going to get out of that situation? You would never put yourself in that kind of danger. So no, it's, if you mark that off, you know, this, uh, uh, let's, let's go down without shoes. It's not a dare you, you want, you just, you want to, you want to no. be warm and fed and sleep and continue the next morning yeah. with the 30 kilo backpack. It's brutal. So, um, what they found in 59 is the tent cut from inside. Let's get to the weirdness of the case. Okay. The tent was cut from inside, but not just like that. It was their openings like doors, like it was totally destroyed as a shelter. So, and very, very fast, they found out that it's done from the inside. There is one of the, there are two expertise uh, in the case files. One is about the tent that they gave an expert, forensic expert. And she was told specific questions if those are tears or cuts. And if they're cuts, if they're done from the outside or inside. And she's very good. And she was very precise that they are cuts. And they were made from inside. But uh, they... She, it's not her place to volunteer information. She could have said how many knives are you uh, have been used, and she could um, describe the rest of the tears and the holes in the tent. Because if you see picture of the tent, is just totally destroyed. Destroyed, and, yeah. Uh, destroyed, but not just from these uh, two big cuts, and even some of the tarpaulin was missing. Which again, I mean, where is it? Uh, because of this suspended stove that was used um, the rest of the nights when they were camping in the in the forest, there was always sparks going from this stove. So there were burns for sure because the search party uh, was using um, the same stoves and uh, not the same, but stoves like that. And even mm -hmm. theirs was on the, on the ground, but these sparks were burning. So they said that the, when they look up, the tent is like planetarium because you see holes everywhere. And also in the diaries, they were saying the whole time that they were arguing who, who has to stitch the next hole. They were the, the tent was staring, but in the expertise from Pichurkina, there is nothing about the rest of the damages because she was asked, especially the cuts, if they were done from the inside or outside. That was important for the lead investigator. So the tent was cut from inside. And then we see footprints. That's one of the weirdest things in the case file because we see footprints which are preserved supposedly for one month. Why they're preserved is because when you step on, on the snow, it's depressed and it's uh, uh, more dense, becomes more dense. And when the, the, the wind is blowing the rest of the snow around that, that footprint, uh, it, st it sticks out like a pillar and the snow is so they're inverted the steps. So, th th I mean, that's not strange. This can happen. The strange thing is that since this is catch 22, because the logic is reversed, since the bodies were found without shoes, then everyone saw these footprints as left by bare feet. This Footprints are not running, they're not limping, they're not straying, they're not panicking, they're nothing like that. It's just they go from the tent, organize down the slope, straight to the place where the bodies were found. In 59, when they found the tent, they saw the footprints, they continue. Uh, it was getting dark, so they went back to sleep. They didn't find the, the, the bodies at the same day when they found the tent. They found the tent, they, they saw the footprints, but the base camp was on the other side of the, on the, of the mountain. It was getting dark. So they went back. They don't have flashlights and things like that. So they went back. They had a very hard night that no one slept because they took everything. They took food and a, a flask of something from the tent and they drank for... Uh, this finding their friends alive is like think of a crime scene right so mm -hmm. they, they they make some additional cuts they get stuff from the tent they go back they drink i mean 
from the things that they could have been poisoned, a lot of theories say. So they didn't sleep because they were very agitated. What are they going to find? Uh, and the next day, the radio communication was, don't let anyone go down because we're going to bring K9. Uh, not to mess with the smells, but they already went down and found the, well, they found the first two bodies. And now the mystery deepens because the bodies were found misplaced. I mean, you don't die in positions like that. They looked like they were dragged by someone and put next to each other very respectfully, but naked from the waist down. So, I mean, with underwear. So, I mean, as if someone, that was the presumption, even until this day, People presume that um, the still alive uh, took clothes from the already dead to warm themselves. Why otherwise they will be missing their pants? So the um, two bodies that were found that was near the the Cedars area, is that correct? Who were those two people? Yeah, names? the first two bodies that were found were uh, Yuri Durushenko, the ex-boyfriend of Zina, and Yuri Krivonishenko, wh- whose name is Georgi, actually. But uh, it's uh, it's common when your name is this and they call you something. I, I cannot explain how uh, Georgi becomes Yuri. <laughs> but for example, Alexander is Sasha. Um, I mean, it's just a nickname. So those are the two Yuris that were found uh, under the cedar tree. So there is a big, big cedar tree. You're going to hear a lot. That's a landmark because this is where the bodies were found and Mm -hmm. where something happened. A lot of it happened because there was a fire with a log that burned for 30 minutes but then no one kept the fire. So they managed to lead the fire. And also there was a lot of activity of broken branches and stamped ground. And so something happened at the cedar tree. So we have the tent, the footprints, and then a mile down, the bodies start mm, appearing. The first two bodies were found under the cedar tree. And then uh, the same day, two more bodies were found on the line. If you put the draw a line from the tent to the cedar tree, they were on the same line. And five days later, a fifth body was found. So the, the three bodies that were laying on the slope were in dynamic poses and somehow a little bit more dressed. So no one took... Uh, if this is the reason from them being naked, the first to being naked, then no one took from clothes from the ones that looked like they were going back to the tent. So for now, it looks like they cut up on the tent, went very slowly. And, and another thing about the footprints is that they don't go one after another. And everyone knows that in the snow, when someone is making the footprint, the, the track, the next one falls in his steps. Not in this case. They were going to breast, like marching on a parade or something, like they were talking. They were in an earshot distance. And this is what they say, that even 2022, uh, the, the Russian researchers are telling me that they were holding hands and going down because they didn't see in the fog. So, you know, you can. there is interpretation of every fact that you hear that... Uh, people make sense of it in certain contexts. So they say, well, they were going slowly, holding hands, so they don't, I don't know. And then they made a fire, five bodies were found. Okay, until now, the uh, did, until that moment in 59, the official uh, version, the case is not close yet, is that there is a hurricane that sucked them up from the tent which on the way they cut with knives and left their socks inside and the shoes. I, I don't know how a hurricane can suck them out or they explain it like that. There was a, maybe someone went out. Oh, and there is a traces of u- urination outside the tent. Like two men were yellow. Just relieving traces. themselves. Yeah. And you, you really can see them in after one month of snowstorms, right? You can see the ur- the traces of urination. I mean, it's not possible. But uh, that someone went out and a hurricane like started uh, tumbling him down and he screamed and the rest. 
darted out, cutting on, open the tent to uh, help his their friend or something like that. I mean, all of the all of the theories that we're going to discuss today, they start uh, with what made them cut open the tent. What happened around the tent? Like yeah. after that, uh, to me, it's a, a lot more difficult to explain what happened down in the ravine because two months. After the first group of bodies, this is what they call them. The first group of bodies could be examined uh, because they were they didn't die that long ago. So we have autopsies of their stomach contents and everything. And no one suspected foul play or any criminal activity because it's a mountain. So if you get out of the tent in your socks and you go down without your shoes and uh, jackets and nothing, head gloves, nothing, you're going to die. But it's weird that they made it down, they made everything possible to survive the night and then died, still died for some reason. Well, campers, this is the end of part one of the Dyatlov Pass mystery. This case is so complex, and because there's so much information and new evidence to consider, there will be a lot to digest. I can only do this case justice by dividing it into multiple parts. I hope you enjoyed part one. Be sure to check out part two, where Teddy and I will uncover the inconsistencies with the original investigation and debunk some of the most probable and outlandish theories. I'll see you next time in the weird wilderness. Together, we will try to solve the mystery of the Dialov Pass.